80. Esto está editado en el 80. Lo que lo habré escuchado al pobre petizo para que termine de editar las que quedaron sin editar. Pero, I think you can start over the whole of the 20th century and think about how science has changed. In 1912, they went to the Antarctic and men risked their lives to bring back the egg of the emperor penguin from the winter, never been seen. And these guys went across the ice in temperatures of minus 50, 60, 70 degrees for weeks. From their actions, you could say, they thought that new discoveries, new knowledge and science was worth risking life for. La nuestra era una familia muy unida, donde había mucho amor, mucho cariño, pero era, muy, era bastante rígida. Eran tres hermanos, el primero era mi papá, el segundo era César y el más chico era Ernesto. César era muy inquieto, muy audaz. Mi papá era más bien tranquilo, serio, más bien adulto. Una familia judía, pero les interesaba, digamos, el judaísmo como cosa cultural. Ellos les desesperaba mucho que yo no leía lo suficiente. Mi madre era una persona profundamente emocional. Yo no soy muy emocional. Y eso ocasionaba ciertos conflictos. Mi abuelo era viajante. Ella se quedaba solo con los chicos y parece que era terrible todo lo que recibía mi abuelo cuando llegaba de las el listado de cosas que había, César, había hecho César. Entre las cosas que había hecho mal, digamos que había hecho preocupar a la mamá y la había hecho renegar, que era un poco peleador, cuando no, no eran las cosas como él quería, y que no quería comer. Yo era una, un hijo muy difícil, muy, muy difícil. Yo tenía ocho años y vino una prima mía, que era mucho mayor que yo, ya, ya había terminado su carrera de química y contaba cómo le sacaban veneno a las, a las serpientes. Y eso me quedó grabado, porque, no sé, me parecía un poco una aventura, un chico de ocho años, ¿no? Sacándole veneno, un poco la aventura mezclada, la parte física de la aventura con la parte intelectual. Y uh, unos años más tarde, mi madre me compró un libro que dejó una marca muy grande para mí, ¿no? Que se llama Los cazadores de microbios señor Paul de Cruyff. Eh, y ahí describe la vida de muchos científicos. Y cada uno, es, en el fondo, es una aventura. Cuando entré a la universidad, empecé a trabajar para el centro estudiante mucho y llegué a ser presidente del centro. Tanto César como mi papá militaban en el anarquismo y el peronismo era para ellos una versión extremadamente autoritaria y muy cercana al fascismo. Digamos, si uno le preguntara, a, le hubiera preguntado a César, yo se lo pregunté, ¿qué pensaba? Y habían para él, Perón era más o menos algo parecido a lo que pudo haber sido Mussolini. Tuve un pequeño periodo de, de dudas de dónde iba a ir mi vida. ¿no? Hubo un momento que tuve una crisis personal y quise independizarme. Yo dije, no, yo me quiero ir a trabajar, me voy a ir al, a conseguir un trabajo en el puerto de marinero, porque quiero viajar. En lugar de estudiar, voy a de, de hacer eso. Yo me llamo Celia, 
Milstein, mi nombre de soltera es Piriel Tensky, soy química y lo conocí a César cuando estábamos estudiando en la Facultad de Ciencias Exactas, los dos estábamos estudiando química. Una vez así, andando por la calle, ¿no? le pregunté si le gustaba cocinar. Me dijo, no, yo odio cocinar, yo a mí cocinar no me gusta para nada. Y dije, lavar los platos? Me dijo, no, lavar los platos no me molesta, yo los lavo siempre, no, eso no me molesta para nada. Entonces yo le dije, mira, vamos a una cosa. Yo cocino, vos lavas los platos y nos casamos. Y así fue. Y un arreglo que quedó para toda la vida. Cuando nos casamos, mucha gente nos preguntó qué queríamos de regalo y nosotros dijimos dinero para irnos de viaje. Estuvimos charlando con amigos que habían ido a Europa y ellos nos dijeron, bueno, con ese dinero van a durar tres meses. Pero César, que era el rey de las finanzas, vale decir, sabía muy bien dónde gastar y dónde no gastar el centavo. Eh, bueno, duramos un año en lugar de tres meses. Y luego, al volver, él se reintegró al laboratorio de análisis clínico para trabajar y poder ganar algo de dinero y sostenernos. Y al laboratorio de Stopani para seguir haciendo su tesis. Para mi abuelo y mi abuela eh, que sus hijos se recibieran en tiempo adecuado, con las notas adecuadas y como correspondía y fueran profesionales, era muy significativo, como solía ser para... Eh, especialmente para los hijos de inmigrantes de la época, ¿no? Era como ingresar a, a, otro lugar so, a otro lugar social. Yo a esa altura ya había empezado a hacer la tesis. Y él lo veía eso de la tesis y no lo entendía mucho. No veía muy bien a dónde iba eso. ¿Y, qué, pero ¿y eso a dónde va eso? Y yo le decía, y nada, es la tesis para recibirme de doctor. ¿Y qué ganas con eso? Si ya podés tener un laboratorio ahora, no necesitas... Eh, entonces, un buen día le dije, y me dijo, ¿pero qué vas a ganar? Y le insistía, ¿no? no quería entender. Y ahí fue cuando la primera vez, más o menos, le digamos, mostré mis cartas. Y yo le dije, bueno, le digo, mira, yo eso lo que puedo hacer es un profesor universitario. Bueno, me dijo, entonces deja de trabajar y yo te, y yo te, y yo te, te, doy, yo te doy una beca. Y yo le dije, no, es, las becas no se consiguen de esa manera, no vienen de los padres. Yo la quiero, cuando tenga una beca, la quiero tener de otra manera. Me dijo, bueno, pero si yo te puedo ayudar, yo te ayudo. Vos decime. Estaba totalmente dispuesto a... a de repente entendió. Eh, esa palabra más o menos le dio la, la clave de lo que yo quería. Pero lentamente... Llega un momento en que uno empieza a comprender al padre, el padre empieza a comprender al hijo más también, a aceptarlo como es. ¿Por qué te, te, te resolvió de irte de la Rusia? ¿Cómo fue el asunto? Los judíos no querían que los varones hagan el servicio militar. Y ya a cierta edad, como la mía, entonces, ya empezaban a pensar cómo hacer para salvarse de eso, para irse. Y como mi tía Mario tenía una llamada de parte de su esposo que ya estaba en Argentina, ya era una esperanza de que voy a estar bien y no hay peligro de que yo vaya. O sea que para vos el asunto no tenía una gran significación. No, no. para nada. 
¿No te dabas cuenta que era la última vez que ibas a no, ver no. a tu familia? No, no, no. Al contrario, yo estaba contento de ir. Para mí era como una cosa, una aventura. Cesar had come to the department in 1958 to take his second PhD, working with Malcolm Dixon, who was an eminent, immuno, uh, eminent enzymologist, uh, who also worked on that floor. So we had a very sort of scientific atmosphere, and I think the lab in itself was very productive from that point of view, really. We all discussed our work together. We didn't. We weren't secretive about it and trying to keep it to ourselves. We wanted to tell people about it. And when we got a good experiment, we would tell other people about it. When we got a bad one, we would <laughs> try and get some help. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, all I can say is that, uh, I mean, that's true. I think we did have a very free and friendly group. We decided that uh, the, the question, what, what was the subject I was going to work? And he, he actually asked me, what did, I, what did I want to work? Whether I wanted to work on something specific or whether he, I wanted him to tell me. And then uh, he got together with uh, Edwin Webb, who was the second man hand, and then they started looking at it, their book. The book had just been published, The Enzymes. And they got all the enzymes were there, and they just started looking at the enzymes one after another. Apparently, this was what I sort of saw. But they, then, then they stopped at one phosphoglucomutase, and they said, "How about phosphoglucomutase?" In fact, it, <coughs> Malcolm was interested in that enzyme because it had been a subject in the Department of Biochemistry before. Fred se enteró que César estaba trabajando en la phosphoglucomutasa le interesó por una razón muy particular, porque alguien había publicado un trabajo sobre el centro activo de la fosfoglucomutasa. Y entonces empezó a decirle a César, ¿por qué no tratas de, de trabajar en el centro activo de la fosfoglucomutasa? Y César primero dijo, pero si eso está hecho. Fred occasionally would sit next to me at tea time and he would ask me how are things going and so on. And uh, what happens with this enzyme and so forth. Y entonces, fue un buen día y lo, cuando lo vio a Fred le dijo, ¿sabes? Se me ocurrió una idea para marcar la enzima muy fácilmente, que es así y así. Ah, qué bien, qué bien, probá, probá. I remember saying, if it turns out that the histidine is in the, in, in, in the active center when we were suspecting it, that would be beyond all my dreams. That would be the end of my dreams. You know, I just, beyond that, I couldn't think of anything else. César se dio cuenta por qué era, porque en realidad el trabajo que se había publicado tenía un error. Pero no, nunca le dijo a César, mira, a mí me parece que eso está mal. Fred Sanger was a dominated figure, dominating figure in the department, very clearly. You know, you could see all the bubbling taking place around, uh, around people working with him. The life was coming from that little lab there at the middle of the corridor. That's where things were really happening. Ayer nos emborrachamos, Celia y yo, en una fiesta muy linda. Resulta que aquí hay un señor que se llama Sanger y se sacó el premio Nobel. El laboratorio estaba todo revolucionado y a la hora del té llegó la noticia oficial. Y el señor Sanger estaba todo emocionado. Nos invitó a todos a tomar champagne y nos tomamos 80 botellas de champagne francés. Sounds to me like an in incredibly productive time for you. Absolutely. It sounds as though, in I many just ways, Fred believe. Sanger was... I couldn't believe. I, 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 I remember saying, you know, when I came to Cambridge, I dreamed that I would get an, a, a new, another degree. And I only had two years to do it, mm. because I knew that the British Council will stop 
at the most. In fact, they stopped at one, but the, Malcolm Dixon could influence them to give me a second year. But I knew that after the second year, that was mm. it. And uh, I had uh, approval from the university to do the thesis in two years. No, era muy lindo. Muy lindo y muy extraño, las dos cosas, por supuesto. Muy lindo porque muy pacífico. Es realmente es una torre de marfil. Para nosotros que veníamos de Buenos Aires, donde el estudiantado tenía preocupaciones políticas, etcétera, etcétera, acá los estudiantes no les importaba nada de la situación política o social, lo cual nos dejaba totalmente pasmados. A mí ya no me falta mucho para volver. Claro que todavía tengo para unos meses, pero este verano que viene vas a ver cómo nos bañamos juntos. Anda diciéndole a tu mamá que te prepare el traje de baño. Así cuando yo vuelva, nos vamos a ir los dos, vos y yo solos, a la parte más honda del río. Y a los demás los vamos a dejar atrás y no van a poder seguirnos porque nosotros vamos a nadar más ligero. El cumpleaños de la familia Milton era muy, muy importante. Porque se estuviera donde se estuviera, se festejaba el cumpleaños del otro. Yo no recibí esto, en realidad era muy chiquitita. Pero bueno, es un poquito para mí simbólico. Porque César siempre, César y Celia, los dos siempre se acordaban de los cumpleaños de toda la gente de la familia. Y entonces, bueno, siempre estaba, casi todas las cartas dicen lo mismo, las tarjetas. Perdón por la tardanza, o ya sé que pasaron como seis meses, pero igual me acordé de tu cumpleaños, estaba en tal lado. So that was three years in Cambridge, working on phosphoglucomutase. Yes. Making important discoveries and developing new techniques. And then it was back to, to Buenos Aires. And then it was back to Buenos Aires, yes. <laughs> Nuestra intención fue volver a la Argentina y por eso volvimos. Volvimos a trabajar al Instituto Malbrán. El director del instituto era Piroski. Había habido mucha gente joven que había sido tomada. Cuando llegué, llegué a un ambiente de realmente de entusiasmo, de mucha voluntad, de ganas de hacer cosas. Piroski quería organizar un instituto que fuera dirigido por los investigadores, con muchas actividades, invitando gente del extranjero, mandando gente del extranjero y atacándonos a problemas que eran problemas nacionales. Instalamos el laboratorio, ¿no? Conseguimos gente para trabajar local. Nosotros llegamos a publicar varios artículos a nivel internacional, de, buen, de muy buen nivel. Un premio Nobel, Lipman, vino a visitar. Quería visitar la Argentina, vino a ver y me, se puso en contacto conmigo porque nosotros habíamos publicado un artículo en un tema que ellos estaban trabajando y nosotros les ganamos. ¿no? Lo sacamos antes que, antes que ellos. el periodo de, de Guido, el que era ministro de Salud Pública, con toda alevosía destruyó el instituto. Eh, Padilla se llamaba. Y eso vino a entrevistarnos a nosotros, a los rebeldes, que estábamos así escribiendo cartas en contra de él porque él había echado al director. Y nos dijo, pero ustedes son chicos muy buenos, científicamente de mucho nivel. En este país no tienen futuro, ¿por qué no se van? Los intelectuales se tienen que ir. 
mejor que se vayan, si son todos comunistas y judíos. Echaron a gente que estaba bajo la dirección de César. Los echaron porque no mandaban informes y cosas, por, cosas ridículas. Así que yo dije que o los reinstalan o, bien, o yo renuncio. César escribió una carta a Fred Sanger y le dijo que estábamos en dificultades si había algún lugar para él acá. Y la carta, la respuesta de Fred volvió a vuelta de correo. I was working on a grant from the Medical Research Council and I didn't have very much space. New building out at the hospital the, was built and a new group was started up. So I offered the job to Cesar and asked him to come back. A sugerencia de, de Fred Sanger, eh, se pone a, a, a estudiar la, las inmunoglobulinas. Que decir inmunoglobulina, decir anticuerpos, son la misma cosa, son totalmente sinónimos. It was going back for many, many years, going back to the plague in Athens, they realized that people who had been looking after those who had succumbed to the plague, but themselves were not ill, were then immune to later infection. And in the 1890s, in Berlin, it really was the work of Emil Baring and a Japanese collaborator, um, Kitisato. And what they found was that people and also horses who were recovering from diphtheria or tetanus contained in their blood something that you could use to protect somebody else. Their blood contained antitoxins, which you could then treat, use to treat other people. And those antitoxins in the blood were antibodies, in fact. And antibodies are protein molecules that um, they all have the same general shape. They have, they're made up of generally four chains two large chains and two small chains that are connected to each other by various means. And at the ends of this Y-shaped molecule, there's a region of the protein that is incredibly variable. It's different in every one of the millions of antibodies that your body makes. tiene que ubicarse en lo que conocíamos en esos años. Sabíamos muy poco de los mecanismos celulares, de, cómo los, de, de los mecanismos por los cuales la célula hacía una cosa u otra. No teníamos ni siquiera los instrumentos para poder estudiarlos. No sabíamos por qué sucedían ciertas cosas. Everybody was worrying about the structure of antibodies, how cells produced antibodies, uh, what the genes were like for antibodies. Everybody was talking about them all the time, throwing out all sorts of crazy ideas. At the time, the, the question was really about what's the genetic mechanism? What does the DNA look like that allows millions of different antibody molecules to be made. El interés era entonces conocer qué cosa había de particular a la base de las inmunoglobulinas. Y la primera cosa que uno hace es empezar a, bueno, cómo están hechas, de qué están hechas. Estas son proteínas, sabemos, todas las proteínas sabemos que están constituidas de los mismos componentes, pero cuáles son exactamente el orden de estos componentes. So something was different in each of the cells. One assumed it had to be at the genetic level. There was something different in the genes that allowed it to, 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 to make a different antibody, one from the other. And that was basically the question, well, how did all that arise? You know, I remember beginning to understand the problem and, uh, and how exciting it was. So when Fred said antibodies, I immediately jumped and said, yes, I know what I want to do. <laughs>
En el laboratorio había un pequeño cuartito que lo usábamos para varias máquinas y teníamos un pizarrón. Y nos poníamos en ese pizarrón a discutir. Entonces, el día que él tenía ganas de elaborar, venía y nos poníamos a hablar. Y uno podía perderse toda la mañana, ¿eh? O sea, y él te quería convencer, como era con todas sus cosas. Él te quería convencer que él tenía razón y que vos estabas equivocado. I remember saying, Cesar once saying, why spoil the fun? If we do the experiment, we'll have the answer, but we're having more fun talking about it than... than, than... So, so he loved to, 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 to talk about it, and he would talk about, about anything and everything. I think it's important that he had some clear views on how to practice science. Um, he very much believed in the power of the dialectic. It's the power of argument. And um, this really was an essential element of his, the way he conducted his science. Sometimes you would go in with a set of ideas, but it would be difficult because until he understood them in his way, you weren't necessarily connecting, but it was worth the effort because once it connected his way, then you had a good exchange. After we'd done the experiments three or four times, and he, he became very convinced and typically very excited, as, as we all, all of us who knew Cesar. He was a very excitable man. When he got enthusiastic about something, you couldn't stop him. Con César, la discusión estaba llevada de tal manera, estaba organizada de una manera tan honestamente liberal y libertaria, yo diría, era tan cercana, tan osmótica, que la menor reflexión sobre un tema terminaba como una exigencia de inteligencia mutua. I got there, I believe, in November, December 1974. Cesar was there with George Curler, and they were doing something that was extremely interesting. Unir una célula que produce el anticuerpo que tú quieres, unirlo con una célula tumoral, de forma que tienes una célula híbrida que tiene las dos características. Te produce el anticuerpo que tú quieres y además es inmortal, crece indefinidamente en cultivo. Eso lo consigo porque la propiedad de dividirse y de ser inmortal de esta célula reside en, el, en los genes, en sus genes que están en el núcleo, y la propiedad de este linfocito de hacer eso reside en sus genes que están en el núcleo. Al haber podido hacer la fusión de un linfocito con un mieloma y haber obtenido esta célula, con estas capacidades, haber transferido las dos propiedades a una sola célula, esa era la clave para ir a buscarlo sobre cualquier otra. How it came about is a, is a bit difficult to say. Either both George and I had thought about the same thing, at the, more or less at the same time, or it was almost there in the other minds. I don't know. But it must have been very much in the surface. 
because immediately there was no need to convince anybody, you know? And we became quite excited about that and decided it was worth trying. Como muchas ideas, ¿no? Uno dice, ah, sería interesante, ¿por qué no probamos a ver si el día que lo haces y que funciona? Dice, pero ¿cómo? Entonces, quiere decir que puedo dar el próximo paso. He did the experiment and it was a tremendous success, number one, and it worked. Monoclonal antibodies, certainly in those days, were incredible tools, new tools, for very specifically finding a particular protein amongst a mixture of hundreds of thousands of proteins. A particular molecule amongst a mixture of hundreds of thousands of molecules. There was a, a lecture, and George Kerler and Cesar described the monoclonal antibody technology. And I remember it was a gentle talk. It, the importance wasn't coming through. It was very modest. And then Sidney Brenner said something like, uh, can I make a monoclonal antibody against my mother-in-law in that talk? I always remember that. And uh, that started an interesting discussion. I think the discussion developed into, well, we should be able to make antibodies against cells of the immune system that we want to attack or target. I was unaware, not unaware that that was perhaps the most important piece of work we, which I have done, actually. He was monoclonal as a means to discover what was the mechanism of specificity in the las inmunoglobulinas en el sistema daba vueltas para llegar a un resultado claro evidentemente cuando encontró esto vio la como se dice el, el, el potencial que esto tenía I remember going on holidays on one stage and telling my brother look this time I think we have done something interesting he didn't care too much about what other people did what they had he thought, what do I have? What's, what have I, what, I did this experiment, I had these results. How do I move on to get the explanation based on what I got? Pero él a veces decía, ¿y esto por qué no ha salido? Y se iba a intentar buscar otras vías que normalmente mucha gente despreciaría. And he often worked, he did many things from within, he didn't come up with lots of new ideas from, for subjects that were very distant to what he was working on. There were always things building up from what he had. So it was very good discipline in that he built a foundation and he didn't keep on jumping or being jealous of what other people had. He just built his own repertoire. There are things that Cesar wrote, look, all notes that he made for, you see, laptop, for instance, those, well. Cesar wrote very well, but very slowly, and argued about every single sentence of a paper. So we, we, I think writing the paper on the work, as a joint between several people, was, um, I think, painful. And I remember on one occasion, I could see the day slipping by, and we'd been two hours on the one sentence, in which the discussions had ranged quite widely because of the different emphasis that each of us took to the ending of the sentence. And finally I conceded. I said, Cesar, you know, I'm wrong, you're right, let's, let's now move on to the next sentence. And he said, no, 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 he said, um, you're right. Uh, so I said, well, well, thank you for saying that. In that case, I'm right. Let's move on to the next sentence. So Cesar said, ah, but you're not completely right, so we can't move on. 
Ceseslav has always been very picturesque. <laughs> he had a lot of people from very different nationalities. So it was a mix of people from all kinds of parts of the world. He made judgments about connectivity. That uh, he, wa he wasn't what you might call the conventional person who was judging each person on, are they the best academic? Did they I think there was something there, but he was looking for some special spark that would connect him with the person. the paper, we, we just said that it could be commercially important. At the end, I said, look, George, do you think we should a sentence at the end about this? Or, and he said, yes, why not? Don't you think it's true? I said, yeah, I, I, I do, but I don't know. It's a bit boasting. I said, no, come on. If we think it's true, we should put it in. If I would have write, written the paper on my own, perhaps I wouldn't have put it in, although I would have thought about it. The MRC asked me to give a talk, and uh, there was uh, Tony Vickers there, and he, he said, uh, don't you think that this should be patent? So I said, uh, I don't know how to go about the, any of that. I don't know. He said, well, don't you worry about that. I will take care of that. Just send me the paper, so which I did. I sent the paper le next day, and he immediately replied to me saying the paper has gone to the NRDC. In the early 80s, I think it must have been around then, uh, Cesar um, got blamed by an official committee, the Sphinx Committee, which basically said that he had been at fault in not filing a patent. Many people assumed and Mrs. Thatcher, the then Prime Minister, was one of those people who assumed that the reason that a patent wasn't taken was because Caesar didn't want to take a patent. And I was furious about that, of course, uh, because uh, I thought that I had done my bit, what I was supposed to do. Maybe a bit late, but I did it when I was asked. You, what do you mean by that? What, what well, I mean? had written, sent, to Tony Vickers these papers, and uh, he had sent them, apparently, to the NRDC. I tried at one stage to go through my papers and find out, uh, but a lot of my papers, I uh, couldn't find them. They have, I think they have disappeared from my files, a lot of them. I have even the original letter from Tony Vickers to me as they had disappeared. I only found copies of some of these things, which I had given to other people. What do you mean, disappeared from your files? Well, that's what I mean, what disappeared from my files. That's what happened. They are not in my file. I always have an open door and anybody can go in and out, you know. So suddenly I began to suspect that things were not as simple as I thought. En algún momento de los 70 hubo algún periodo en que por alguna razón a César algunas cosas no le salieron bien. Que mi papá le escribía mucho y, y se comentaban. Esta mañana me dijo mamá que había recibido una carta de ustedes. Si ustedes en principio van a poder tomarse las vacaciones, nos escriben, nos dicen que les gustaría más, así de modo que uno hace todo lo contrario, ¿eh? y así las cosas tienen que ser bien entre hermanitos que se quieren, ¿eh? y que, en fin, espero verlos pronto. Y bueno, mi papá tuvo momentos en su actividad política y en la vida familiar, momentos muy duros. Eh, y, y él también estuvo muy cerca. Haciendo alguna crítica o haciendo alguna observación, estando en desacuerdo. 
que eso también era lindo. O sea, ellos podían estar en desacuerdo, no es que estaban de acuerdo en todo, más bien discutían bastante y había muchas cosas que estaban en desacuerdo. Pero en el desacuerdo compartían. Well, the, the story of the antibody engineering starts really around 1980. I gave a talk at the Royal Society, and in that talk I uh, begin to explore uh, the ways in which monoclonal antibodies are going to go further. One of the issues I raised there is the possibility of uh, combining monoclonal antibodies with genetic engineering. Antibodies are natural therapeutics that are used to fight um, bacteria and viruses. Um, the importance of monoclonal antibodies was that it meant we could turn these natural antibodies against other non-infectious diseases such as cancer, and um, diseases of the immune system. The problem with drugs, and drugs as we think of them, is how to get the drug to the place you want. And sometimes there are diseases of a particular tissue where you would just like the drug in that tissue but nowhere else, like a cancer. So the good thing about antibodies is that they have the ability to bind very tightly to a structure, which is, could be a marker for a particular tissue or a tumor or whatever, and they can home in there. So the, the word, the language that was used before was magic bullet. They're able to come there and localize and bind. And so if they come with a payload to deliver damage, they can do what a lot of the small drugs were not able to do before. In industry, they didn't really believe in them. They believe in small molecule drugs because uh, they understood them. They have a lot of very good chemists. Uh, all of those people are in the research and development arms of the company. No one's come up through, or very few people have come up through, the biologicals, the protein route. There's so few people in the industry on that. And the thing that changed um, the field, really, was, first of all, the realisation that you could make antibodies less immunogenic. And secondly, when the first people started to make a profit from their antibodies. That's when industry really became very interested. Everyone kind of piled in to antibodies. And so now we have, as I say, about 17 antibodies approved. But in 1994, there wasn't one approved by the FDA. Later on, I had uh, another couple of situations in which uh, I was asked to be a member of scientific advisory boards in, in actually two companies. And one was in, during the creation of CAT. CAT was more or less a creation of our lab. You know, it really was all coming from work. Um, it was the brainchild mainly of uh, uh, three people, actually. But uh, Greg was uh, at the forefront. And, uh, Greg, and Winter. I, Greg Winter. I was uh, very keen on that to start, uh, but I asked them not to put me in the uh, in the board of directors, which was the original idea. I prefer to be in the scientific advisory board. We developed these sort of principles in which we should operate, and in which the first uh, one was uh, the benefit of the public in general. And uh, the second one was uh, uh, the, the, the respect and, uh, of the wishes of the scientist, which should be, uh, the patent should allow for that. And the third one was to try to make money. Uh, but the order was that one. Era muy abierto con las empresas biotecnológicas, 
al mismo tiempo era muy severo con las empresas, en el sentido de que eh, eh, él ponía ciertas condiciones. Si quieren hacer estas cosas, lo pueden hacer, pero no pueden pretender que los científicos se transformen en, 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 en empleados, digamos, solamente de, la, de las compañías. The involvement in these companies can be very uh, exciting and it, uh, it really brings issues to your mind. Uh, in a certain way, on the other hand, you know, the, 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 these issues are important in terms of public health and things like that, but they run the risk of disturbing your own sort of search or your own curiosity in a direction which perhaps is not the most profitable, or not always the most profitable. So there is a fine balance. I, it is a very exciting thing to do. Monoclonal antibodies will have affected his, his own viewers. I mean, apart from affecting the world, it had an enormous impact on his own research career because he then, after that, managed to keep both an interest in the basic science, basic mechanisms, and interest in technology development. I never regretted uh, having been in those things, um, but uh, I can see that uh, they can become sort of too absorbing very easily. And uh, so, you know, you have to decide what really you want. <laughs> Me escribís que el premio Nobel pegó en el palo. Efectivamente, este fue el segundo año que los periodistas me aseguraron el día anterior o dos días antes, e incluso unas horas antes del anuncio, que me había tocado a mí. Cuando estuvimos en Japón el año pasado, en octubre, me atacaron con cámaras de televisión y todo como si fuera un político famoso o un artista de cine en medio de un escándalo. No me divierte para nada. El mejor chiste lo hizo un amigo mío. Los premios Nobel son como los grandes vinos, mejoran con el tiempo y hay que dejarlos madurar antes de tomarlos. La macana es que un buen día se hace vinagre. En realidad se venía hablando del Nobel hace un tiempito, porque él sabía que estaba nominado. Eh, y era como un chiste. Mi señora me habló por teléfono a mí, la secretaria le dijo, mira, le dijo, está, quiero hablar con César urgentemente. Y dice, César está en el seminario. Y dijo, bueno, está bien, cuando termine, ni bien termine el seminario, que me venga, que me hable. Resulta que cuelga el tubo y, claro, le hablaron ya los periodistas. A esa altura ya era imposible comunicarse. Y el director le había dicho que si había alguna noticia rara, él se lo estaba oliendo. Que, que se lo diga él primero. Y el director levanta el, el bastón, baja las escaleras así como un... Y dice, I have an announcement to make. Tengo, una, tengo que... Tengo que decir algo, un anuncio. Eh, César got Nobel Prize. Bueno, era un verdadero holgorio, ¿no? Era una alegría inmensa de todos, absolutamente de todos. Y bueno, y ahí se empezó a armar la historieta de cómo iba a recibir el premio Nobel. Y César, como siempre, quiere con toda mi familia recibir el premio Nobel. Fue con mi mamá, mi papá, mi abuelo. Eh, mi hermano de allá con mi cuñada y mis otros dos tíos. Y después se rieron mucho de la tuenda de todos, porque todos se tenían que disfrazar. Eh, y César era bastante payaso, y disfrazarse me parece que no era algo que le, le preocupaba mucho. Para mí eso era 
la culminación, digamos, de, de mis sueños, en cierta medida, de cierto tipo de sueño, ¿no? Uno, el reconocimiento, no solamente uno lo busca de sus pares científicos, sino también de su familia, de que uno no ha perdido el tiempo, de, yo qué sé, es una manera de... Y yo los tenía ahí, para mí yo estaba contento, no, no pensaba en nada, era simplemente recibir placeres, ¿no? Så kom det Cesar Milstein, som idag har bett att få ha Storbritannien som hemland. Imorgon så kommer han att vara argentinare. Han är en av dem som har dubbla medborgarskap. Cesar Milstein arbetar vid berömda Cambridge universitetet i England, alltså född i Argentina. Milstein. Acá tenemos la posibilidad de mandarle algunas palabras eh, para el día ese que esté en Estocolmo. Eh, lo vamos a recordar mucho. Le mandamos muchas felicitaciones este, y esperamos que sigan los éxitos. You may have in a number of bits of my talk this uh, sense of déjà vu. And partly uh, because uh, you may begin to be wondering when are we going to have our refreshments. <clears throat> Yet I must do my job. I've been well paid to do that. Uh, and so let me start. I think at the moment um, there's a lot of money to be made uh, in monoclonal antibodies. The sales of monoclonal antibody products um, in 2008 was more than 15 billion US dollars. You see, the dilemma is for a pharmaceutical company to develop a drug like an antibody, it may have to spend a billion dollars. So the investment is huge, so they have to believe in it enough to go all the way. The costs of the drugs can be very high. So, for example, they can range between um, a cost of about uh, $10,000 uh, per annum to about $50,000 for, let's say, a year's treatment with the antibodies. So the reason they're high, of course, is that they are effective. And so if you don't have any other choice, um, then you may have to use them. I, I remember in the beginning I said that I, 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 I was concerned about the price and that I, if, I had pay, you know, if I was to, to, to help them, then they should charge and I wanted to have some control of the price. But that didn't last very long. I mean, it was an impossible proposition, of course. And I am, at the moment, I am horrified some of the prices they are charging for the, some of these monoclonal antibodies to, you know, directed to tumors and so on. I know how much cost to make them, and it is outrageous what they charge. The difficulty is always in medicine is how to introduce a new drug when you have other drugs there that are doing the job. You have to demonstrate some benefit, some advantage. The pharmaceutical companies also have to weigh up. Are they going to generate enough money from selling it against the costs against the risks. Cesar's mm. point of view was that the um, biotechnology revolution was important. He knew, of course, he had contributed in a major way to that through the discovery of monoclonal antibodies. But uh, uh, quite apart from his own contribution, he, he felt that it was essential that biology paid attention in a major way to the applications of biology in industry or in medicine. As a product of a socially organized activity, scientific knowledge is very different from soap, and those who plan for science neglect that difference at their peril. 
The illusion that there is a natural science standing pure and separate from all involvement with society is disappearing rapidly, but it tends to be replaced by the vulgar reduction of science to a branch of commercial or military industry. Unless science itself is to be debased and corrupted and its results used in a headlong rush to social and ecological catastrophe, there must be renewed understanding of the very special sort of work of scientific inquiry. In 1995, you formally retired, um, but in fact, you seem to have been working very actively. Well, when you say very actively, I mean, it all depends. Uh, how do you measure activity? Um, I don't go to the lab uh, in the middle of the night or stay until God knows what hours. Each time I work less and my group has been restricted more and more. Uh, I, until last year, I, had, I still had a group of uh, working for me of about five, six people. Six people, I think. And uh, now we have uh, four and continually less and less uh, is diminishing. <laughs> Me había escrito una carta diciendo que o sea, lo había jubilado, pero que él seguía en el laboratorio y estaba todo bien. Que una cosa son los homenajes y otra cosa son nubilarse por el homenaje y no estar atento a lo que uno hace. Uno tiene que estar produciendo. Lo otro que sigo homenajeando, pero que lo importante es lo que uno produce y que lo que produce valga la pena para algo. Que si no, dejó de dedicarse a otra cosa. Extraordinary being there at the time of people like David Secker, you know, when monoclonal antibodies had just won his Nobel Prize and monoclonal antibodies were being made here, there, and everywhere to everything. And, and then I think I was sort of post that phase the first time. Then the, the last time I was there, there, there was a change in a sense. There was a, I mean, I think there was a lot of pressure on Cesar to scale down and they took away his tissue culture lab. It was a difficult time. There were only, towards the end, there were only, you know, about four of us in the lab. And that was a real contrast to before. And there were times when none of us were really producing results. He would then go and dig out all of these old antibody sequences and sit there for hours just looking at the sequences and then produce a statistical program to analyze them and find some interesting results, you know. So he had this extraordinary capacity for delivering, if you like, for producing scientific results, even when he didn't have any data. He would then still squeeze data out of information he already had. Incansable, caminamos, yo podía decir, se paraba un poco y decía, bueno, espera, espera, vamos a descansar un rato. Pero se paraba ahí mientras se reponía, reponía fuerzas. Se dice, bueno, mientras tanto, contame, ¿qué estás haciendo? Since I started with immunology, 
you know, and I asked my first question for the first time, I said, God Almighty, it must be possible by chemistry methods to show whether there is only one antibody molecule or many. That was my first question. It must be possible. That was the beginning of the story. And since then, you know, the, 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 I was lucky to have chosen a subject which is always moving ahead. You know, the subject is moving. You know, you make an advance and you realize that you are just as far off the end as you were before you made the advance, you know, because the, the thing is expanding. You know, the, the, the comprehension of the subject is expanding and new things are appearing in the low horizon. So you start chasing those things and they keep going away. August 2001. I said, so that I know how it works because we had a lot of data from different lines of uh, how antibodies are changed in different ways. And it gave idea to a model that made a lot of sense of the data. So I said to Cesar, look, I know how it works, but we just haven't proved it. He said, don't tell me, because we often play those games together. He said, don't tell me, but come back and tell me when you've proved it. Early, and we, early 2002, and I had written a draft of the manuscript. And I went to Cezanne and said, now I can tell you, we've got some data. He said, don't tell me, still don't tell me, I've got something for you. Cezanne was feeling that he wasn't perfectly well and he wanted to complete that work and send it off. Um, and in fact, he was in hospital uh, when we actually sent the paper. And then he allowed me to tell him our story. Yeah, that was on a Wednesday. He wasn't feeling that well. That was on a Wednesday. But he... But... Um, I went through it because I was very keen to tell it to him. I thought he'd be excited. This is Adrian Walston. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. And John Jarvis, who is, uh, Hi. has been with me now for 35 years. Yeah. Yes, it's getting that way, so. It's Just about. Yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, Pedro Aparicio is someone coming from Spain. A Spaniard. Muñeta is my office. Hello. Speaking. Yo le pregunté cómo andaban sus trabajos y porque además como me había acordado que en algún momento no no estaba muy conforme y entonces me dijo muy contento. Ay, no, ahora estamos todos muy contentos otra vez porque encontramos y que había sido, creo que algún colaborador de él que había, le había dado en la tecla con algo y ahí eh, le había dado un impulso importante al, al trabajo. Estaba en su último paso para, para encontrar lo que había soñado, yo no sé, pero alrededor de los 30 años, supongo, ¿no? Sometimes I feel that uh, I, I have some one of these brainwashing ideas and then they said, oh my God, I need another one to do this or the other. But then perhaps uh, I realized that I would, I am not sure how much energy I have left. Fue lindo escucharlo porque era como que daban ganas de investigar cualquier cosa, digamos, él transmitía una, una ilusión muy grande por, por el descubrimiento. ¿no? Yeah.